Hello, Duke fans, and welcome to episode 473 of the Duke Basketball Report podcast. Happy New Year. It is January 1st, 2023, a year that we all hope is going to be better than last year. For, you know, no matter how your last year went, we hope that this coming year is better. Hopefully it's starting off on a good foot because I am here to talk to you. I am your host for this episode. I'm Sam Klein. I'm joined, as I usually am, by Donald Wine, but not, unfortunately, by Jason Evans, who is returning from his New Year's Eve travel, so is unable to join us today, and we wanted to make sure we reacted to the Florida State game as soon as we could. So, Donald, hello. Thank you for being here on this holiday. How are you, and how was your New Year's Eve? Oh, it was good. Uh, Happy New Year to you and Happy New Year to everybody out there as well. Um, I think it is fitting in my end that 2022 ended kind of on a sour note with Michigan losing in the college football playoff. But thank you to Ohio State for starting 2023 off with a bang. And when I mean bang, I mean them kicking a field goal 30 yards to the left of where they're supposed to to lose out on their playoff game. So uh, that leaves me with uh, the hope that 2023 is going to be a lot better than 2022 i was at a wedding last night with uh, a number of michigan alumni but an even Mm -hmm. larger contingent of penn state alumni so uh the the overarching mood at the wedding was joy from the penn state folks that all of the big 10 teams were losing that was mm-hmm. the that was the dominant dominant feeling. So I was a, I wasn't able to watch the Ohio State game because that was like during the the festivities. But uh, I had the, most of the Michigan game on. It was we don't need to go into it in too much depth because I don't want to keep twisting the knife on you. And also we have a Duke victory to talk about. Last time we recapped the Duke basketball game, we were sort of all sitting here stunned that Duke had managed to lose to Wake Forest. And then we previewed this Florida State game and we said. Look, this one should be even easier than the Wake game, so really don't worry about it that much. And I think we were right. Duke wins 86-67, to nearly a 20-point victory at Cameron Indoor without the regular crazies there. And we need to talk about that. We need to talk about the performances of a few really outstanding players, unexpected outstanding players for Duke. But let's start, Donald, with the headline from this game. So I know we've got some listener headlines to get to, but give me your headline first for Duke's win against Florida State. Yeah, so my headline is, young man's game, Ryan's perfecto helps Duke blast FSU. And we got a number of submissions that referenced uh, Ryan Young and plays on his name. So I went with with a Ryan Young pun as well, but mine is simply, Ryan is young. Leonard Hamilton is old. <laughs> but hey, I, I dare to say that Leonard Hamilton might look younger than Ryan Young. It is still. <laughs> it is possible. <laughs> That's that no slight on Ryan Young. But I, I, I think you that is I that think, is all about Ryan, Leonard Hamilton. I think you might be right. Although the, the ham sauce might be uh might be starting to leak a little bit because uh Leonard Hamilton did not bring the usual Florida State situation into Cameron Indoor. We had told you that was going to be the case even in the preview based on, you know, injuries and and also a little bit of uh, roster misconstruction from Coach Ham. But the result, of course, is a great victory for Duke. Uh, Donald, before we get to the good, do you have uh, one or two listener headlines that you wanted to highlight? Yeah, there was a couple, and we got quite a few uh, nice headlines. And a lot of them, as you mentioned, Sam, referenced uh, Ryan Young. So I'm going to start with Jim Baumgartner. He He wrote, Young and Restless, Duke Second Half Tsunami Drowns Team from Tallahassee. A lot of alliteration there. Obviously, a Young and a Restless reference. Uh, For for those of you who uh, used to watch TV at 1, 2 in the afternoon during the work week, um, that's a good one. Clinton Weaver also, again, about Ryan Young, he goes, quote, Young Man, perfect in YMCA game versus Knowles. So all the headlines reference Ryan Young. We both referenced Ryan Young. Let me just very quickly, before I ask for your reaction, read you the immaculate stat line. 20 points on seven shots. He was seven for seven from the field, six for six from the free throw line. He also added 12 blocks for a double-double, including five, or five, 12 rebounds, rather, uh, including five offensive rebounds. And uh, even notched two assists 
on this game, some of which were pretty impressive. After the game, uh, they did some of that, you know, Duke Blue Planet behind the scenes stuff with Ryan Young, and he was giving a lot of credit to teammates for feeding him. Uh, that man was being modest because most of his points oh, yeah. were coming off uh, shots that he created, whether they were offensive rebounds that he grabbed or whether it was Young getting the ball like 10 or 12 feet from the basket and driving through two or three Seminoles to get to the hoop. So, Donald, give me your your reaction to what I guess we have to call the Ryan Young game, uh, at least so far in the season. So, uh, real quick, a couple of stats about Ryan Young's perfecto. Um, he is the sixth Duke player all time to score 20 plus points on 100% shooting. That, again, like you mentioned, includes free throws and field goals. He is also the first player ever to do it with 10 plus rebounds. So, error of his own uh, that game last night. But yeah, you mean, Sam, we've talked about his game and how we kind of reference it as the old man's game. But no, really, it he was destroying cats last night with his little dream shake that he does. I know that's a little homage to uh, Hakeem Olajuwon, but he had a couple of moves where he grabs the rebound and created his own space to be able to put shots up. And, and as you mentioned, there wasn't a lot of contested shots where he had to go over somebody. But when he did, he was able to find a way or find a lane to lay it off the glass and lay it in. And it just it just dumbfounded Florida State's big man all night. He was he was a force. And again, I, I think the fact that a lot of them were created off of offensive rebounds, second chance points that led to, you know, Duke having quite a few. Uh, I mean, 13 second chance points off of 10 offensive rebounds. And again, he had five of five of those offensive rebounds. And I think from there, he created at least eight points out of them. So, I mean, he was very effective in that. You referenced uh, the dream shake, the NBA player that I was thinking about watching Ryan Young last night. And this is a, a completely unfair comparison, but the image popped into my mind of the way that Zach Randolph used to just barrel through oh, guys yeah. to get, yeah. uh, to get easy baskets at what, what, appeared to be easy baskets at the rim, but they're actually like very hard working baskets at the rim because he's going through guys and, and, and the defenders are trying to figure out how to keep up with him. I, I would not be surprised if Ryan young at some point told us that he was watching Zach Randolph videos because there was, there was a lot of that, not just force, but grace in, in being able to turn around multiple defenders. That was what I think was so impressive about the performance is that, is that Florida State figured out that they had to put extra bodies on him. And look, we had, we talked about how they're not the usual size of a Florida State team. So Ryan Young might be bigger than everybody on that team other than McLeod, who doesn't play that much. So, you know, it, it's one thing that he wasn't being guarded by big guys, but it's not like a, against huge competition. We've seen Ryan Young do this sort of thing this year. And maybe the the only cold water that you want to throw on it is this is a Florida State team that's not very big. And you, you'd love to see Ryan Young do this against uh, against a, a team with a with a stronger front line than FSU. But what a performance, especially given that uh, the rest of the bigs last night were not up to their their usual selves. Kyle Filipowski wasn't bad by any means, but he wasn't, you know, his his usual assertive self on offense. So the points had to come from somewhere. Can we talk, Donald? Also about uh, Jalen Blakes, a guy who was getting getting the starting nod last night. He starts in place of Tyrese Proctor, uh, goes for 17 points, his second game in a row where he goes for 17 points. And that's on six of 11 shooting, which is a night that you're going to take any time. Four for six from three for Jalen Blakes and a couple of pretty nifty layups as well. Um, also seemed like from the beginning of the game, he was Duke's starting point guard. What did you think, I guess, first about Jalen Blake's performance yesterday and, and, and how much he's, he's shown between the Wake game and, and the FSU game? And specifically, Donald, I want you to talk about the point guard situation right now and sort of how you think that's going given Blake's performance in the last two games. Well, it kind of shows me that his performance against Wake was not an aberration, that it's something that, hey, the work that he's been putting in, we've talked a lot about how his progression has come over the last you know year or so since he's since he first arrived on Duke's campus as a freshman and having the confidence to lead the offense, distribute the ball when he needed to take threes when he needed to. I believe he's now our our best three point shooter statistically uh, on the team. I think he's shooting 42 and a half percent from three. And again, his shot when he was taking him, he was working his way into open positions. He was 
taking those shots confidently, even if he missed it, it felt like, again, he was doing the right things to either, you know, tip the rebound out or stop the play so that uh, his team had a chance to get back. Uh, he was great on defense and uh, say what you want about his offense, but his defense helped keep him on the floor. It wasn't like he was a defensive liability, quite the opposite. He was, you know, really do- working hard to uh, stymie uh, the Florida state guards. And when it comes to the point guard situation, I-, I don't think anything has changed. I think this is kind of John Shire's way of pronouncing a shakeup, right. And and giving a guy who, I mean, this was what his 33rd game as a Duke blue devil uh, that he's a pure dead. And his first ever start. And he made the most of that opportunity. Just like against Wake Forest, he made the most of his opportunity coming off the bench and getting that extra playing time. All of that is going to keep building that confidence. And again, you want that from a guy who, in the grand scheme of things, is a veteran on this team. He's one of the guys who knows this offense and can play this offense and knows what ACC play is like. He's going to be counted on to really uh, provide some production when it comes to ACC season, which we're now in the midst of. And he, you know, responding to this. For, I mean, if you think about it, this is really the start in our mind of the ACC season, because after this, there's, I mean, there's just ACC games two, three times a week. He's going to be counted on to provide a lot of production. And for him to be, come off the bench or to start and do that, I think is great. And I'll talk about Jeremy Roach a little bit more in the bad, but it's clear to me that Roach is still a little hurt. He yes, he absolutely moving. He wasn't moving perfectly last night, so he doesn't have his best game. But in the absence of that, it's really important that that Jalen Blakes is able to step up in in his place. We know that Roach and Blakes can play together for long stretches if they're if they're both playing well because they actually play off each other pretty decently and and they can switch a lot on defense. But uh, great for for Blakes to take the mantle there. The one other item in the good that I wanted to talk about, Donald, you mentioned Blakes' defense. I think in general, Duke had a had a pretty nice defensive night. Uh, didn't let Florida State grab almost any offensive rebounds. Uh, FSU was not shooting the ball well, especially from deep. And when any FSU player sort of started to get things going, Darren Green, uh, particularly at, at at different points in the game, Duke kind of reshuffled the defense and let them, you know, and, and, and confused Florida state a bit. I think there was great uh, switching by most of the guys on the team and also an aggressiveness to, to hunt for turnovers. Kyle Filipowski uh, uh, forced uh, a couple of travels in, in his aggressive defensive effort. So maybe not flips biggest offensive output of the season, but a great defensive effort from him. And I think from the rest of the team, especially shaking off some rust, from the uh, from the Christmas break. Yeah, and I mean, they they only allowed 25 points in the first half. I believe over the course of the game, they had at least five uh, possessions end in a shot clock violation um, on defense for and a lot of and, and a lot of and a lot, a lot of uh, air balls that. Yeah, sort of yeah, I was like going to say clock violations, desperation air balls to to force shot clock violations that I mean, the defense there and there was a couple of guys who it felt like every time they got the ball in their hands, the the camera crazies or, or you know the people who were sitting in section 17 were giving them the business because every single time it seemed like they were getting the ball 30 feet away from the basket back turned to the basket with a desperation heave and just hitting nothing but air on the way down so the the team i thought had a great defensive effort and i think that is what again that energy that they that they had there led to all other parts of their game i do want to mention one other player specifically and that is Dariq Whitehead coming off the bench, 16 points, uh, two assists, one steal, run rebound, again, active on defense. And it leads to the, I thought, the greatest stat of the evening. And that was our bench points, 46 bench points. The last time we had 46 points off the bench was back in March. Or, I'm sorry, February of 2005 at a game against Wake Forest. So, our, our, our I mean, who that's came off by, the bench in that game? That's a great question. That must be like, Daniel Ewing or something like yeah. didn't start and then came in and did like 30 points or something. Because JJ but, and, and Sheldon scored most of the points on that team. Yeah, JJ, Sheldon, you yeah, Ewing. Like I I'm I'm not sure who who was on that team that was you know coming off John, bench. Sean Dockery to, wasn't starting. No, he wasn't starting, but I mean, yeah, he he had those games where he could have gone for you know 15 points. But yeah, I I think it's probably it's probably some big men that we're forgetting too. Um oh, th- that was probably now, present, now, but, now we're now we're in trouble, aren't we? Yeah, someone will someone will email us dbrpodcast at gmail.com. Tell us who was on that team. <laughs> um, but I, I think 
the thing about the bench is that, you know, again, you had, you know, Ryan Young coming off the bench. He had his 20. Dariq Whitehead came off the bench. He had 16. Jacob Grandison, I thought, came off the bench and performed very well. Uh, you know, there was a lot of production from everywhere. And even the starters that kind of struggled, they were still active on defense and they were active. It led for the bench to be active on the offensive end. So I thought it was just a great team effort and a great response to the energy that was lacking from the weight game. It was clearly present in this game and it showed by how they pulled away against Florida state and how they maintained that, you know, close to 20 point lead throughout the majority of the second half. Let's get to the bad because I think there's there's a few things that I want to address here. But where do you want to start on the bad? I, I know that I I kind of teed up the topic of Jeremy Roach, and you could take that wherever you want. Or if there's somewhere else you wanted to start in the bad, let, let's move to that. I, I honestly want to start up front in the front court um, because Kyle Filipowski and Derek Lively, I think together didn't have their best game. And I'm going to I'm going to kind of flip it into a positive in a second. But, you know, Derek Lively had 12 minutes. Uh, he only was on the court 12 minutes, even though he started. Now, part of that was probably because Ryan Young was pitching a perfect game. But he, I mean, Derek Lively only had two blocks and one rebound. He didn't attempt a shot. He he wasn't really there on offense. Uh, but was one thing that I saw on TV and Jonathan Bow, who wrote in to us, said this uh, from someone who was at the game. The fact is that Derek Lively is very enthusiastic when he's not in the game. He's one of the guys that's on the bench, always, you know, rallying his troops and really supporting his teammates. And I think that's good, right? Like, it's not just the fact that he is a player on Duke's team that's, you know, on the bench. Our bench is usually very active and supporting whoever's on the floor at any one time. But the fact that he's like the number one recruit and was not getting a lot of playing time, has not really had such a great year as we expected because of the injury that he suffered so close to the start of the season and just how that's kind of lingered through the first part, third of the season it's easy for someone to get down on themselves and in, in in turn not show this kind of support that is necessary, but he hasn't done that. He's never wavered from his support of guys on the team when they're on the court and he's on the bench. And I think that's something to be commendable because not everyone in that position reacts the way he does. And I think that shows a lot of maturity on his part for being so young uh, to be able to continually be involved in the game in some aspect, even if not support, if he's not doing well on the court, he can at least be a great teammate, and he's showing that. I think the same thing goes for Kyle Filipowski. Um, Kyle Filipowski did not make his first basket until like a minute into the second half, but it wasn't for lack of effort. It wasn't because he was, you know, shying away from anything. He just wasn't forcing himself into the into the offense. And as other guys got hot, like Jalen Blakes was hitting threes, Dariq Whitehead's coming off the bench hitting threes. You know, Ryan Young's hitting stuff inside. Kyle Filipowski's like, yo, let them let these guys cook. And I think the only thing that I'll say bad about his performance is he tends to get a little, um, a little upset, n- maybe with himself, but demonstrably upset whenever there's a bad call against him. And he gets bad calls against him in almost every game. And I think the one thing that he'll have to learn to do is to, you know, kind of rein those emotions in. Cause especially during ACC season, we get a, you know, a Roger Ayers uh, or Teddy TV, Teddy showing up that can turn into a technical. And I know that's not what he wants to do. And I know he wants to win. He wants to be involved, uh, but I think he's going to have to learn how to produce in other ways when other guys are being hot. I think he did that well last night. And I think he should hopefully continue that even if he's on a night where he's not going to affect anyone on the offensive end. I was going to say that it on a night where Duke wins by nearly 20 and is clearly the better team. Totally fine for me if Kyle Filipowski, in a way, takes a night off on offense to let some other, you know, offensive strategies develop. Let Ryan Young get get points. Let other guys do some of the scoring for Duke. I think it helps Duke in the long run that they have more weapons than than just Filipowski because you know into ACC play that defenders will key into to flip, and if that means that other guys get open and, and can actually start making shots, which has been a challenge for Duke this season, then I'm all for it. I I, I think that the worst thing about Filipowski is that I'm not sure that his his uh, fade is expertly uh, done on the back of his head. So <laughs> who I mean, who, are we, hey, who are we as a couple I'll, of bald guys? To, hey, you got to give criticize? him a pass. You got to give him a pass. It's during the holidays. The barber shop might not be open during regular hours. You know how that is. So, you know, I think once next week happens, then he'll maybe get back to the regular flow of his uh, of his tr- traditional cut. I haven't been to a barber shop in like 
12 years. So I, I don't remember what this is like. <laughs> this, is, this is sort of sort of uncharted territory for me. And then uh, on on the topic of Lively, Donald, I'm, I'm glad you sort of talked about his challenges a little bit. We did get an email from listener James Allen talking about how we should we should like lay off lively a little bit. Uh, he's, he says he's disappointed in, in Duke fans who talk about what a disappointing recruit lively is. Uh, and then is like, you know, we need to remain uh, in, as he says, in touch with reality. His number one status is based on potential uh, and, and injury has not hastened his development. It's taking time for him to adjust. I agree with, with James here that, you know, we need to be a, a little more, uh, we, we need to wait, I think, a bit on Lively. The production, as you mentioned, from Whitehead was great yesterday. And hoping that he continues to get better, especially against better competition, such that he does eventually take his place in the starting lineup. Uh, that is probably like the best version of Duke should have Derek Whitehead in the starting lineup and not Absolutely. coming off the bench, even if it's coming off the bench productively. The other kind of elements in the bad that I, I told you I wanted to talk about a bit was Jeremy Roach. I think he's still hurt. He There was one play yesterday where like he came up a little weird after after getting turned around on defense, and then he kind of had to take a minute to wait. He had to go sit on the bench for a bit. So we know that Roach has a hurt foot. Uh, I will I will refrain from from being too negative about his statistic, his poor statistical output yesterday, given that he's one, probably still hurt and two, that Jalen Blakes was clearly ready to to step in for him. Uh, when I asked you about the point guard situation earlier, the, the thing that I noted is that Blakes was taking the ball up and taking some of the tougher defensive assignments from the start yesterday. Tyrese Proctor played fewer minutes than he usually does. And he and Jeremy Roach all had ball handling duties last night, but it felt like Jalen Blakes was the, was the primary initiator. I also kind of like that from the perspective of Blakes is good at finding other guys and sort of looking for them to to start cooking before he does it himself. He's a he's a fairly unselfish player from that perspective, even though he had a lot of points last night. So uh, I'm I'm curious to see what John Shire does with the with the point guard situation on offense going forward, because I don't I don't want to get to the end of the season and have it feel like Duke has three or four primary ball handlers, because then we get to the other problem that I've sort of noticed with this team. Uh, Something to address in the bad is that I'm not sure that Duke has like a reliable guy to just get a bucket when things are going weird. There was a a point in the second half yesterday and look, Duke had Duke had great scoring output in the second half. But as you mentioned, Donald, Florida State only scores 25 in the first half. So they were pouring it in in the second half. And I thought that given Duke's advantages in athleticism and size against FSU, at least among the guys who played the Duke actually should have extended this lead a little harder. And it was a bummer for me that they weren't able to do that. There were a couple periods uh, in the second half where Florida state clawed back to like to within 10, they didn't really challenge Duke. It's not like it got within three and the crazies had to get up and, you know, and, and really change the tide. But uh, I, I sort of wish that against a team like FSU that, look, is not tournament bound, that Duke would have been able to to pour it on a little bit harder. I, I think when it comes to Jeremy Roach, right, like he has what we call a hitch in his giddy up, right? Like he's still he's he's 100 percent when in terms of being able to play, but it's not like he can, you know, zoom down the court like he needs to or or even have the full confidence to drive the lane and get one of those layups that he's been so great at doing over the last like you know, eight months or so. I think it's more of he needs to figure out a way to get healthy and get that back. But I do think it is a good thing that we have three guys that we can consider options for being the primary ball handler. I think you're right in saying that it shouldn't be all three in the course of one game. But I do think there's opportunities where you can say, hey, look, Jeremy Roach is not 100%, so I want to move him out to shooting guard. Jalen, you you handle the ball. Tyrese, when you come in, you handle the ball. Um, or hey, Jeremy, we this is it, it, think of it like a pitching rotation, right? Like in in the playoffs where game six and game seven, the manager may say, hey, you know, Sam, it's your turn in the, in the rotation, but I'm gonna go with Jason because Jason has more experience, like that sort of thing. And I think when it comes to our point guard situation, I think we now can say that we have three established ball handlers that John Shire can go to and say, hey, we're playing this team. I want to go with this game plan. That means Tyrese, you have the ball. 
Next game, it could be Jeremy Roach. But I do think that eventually it's going to be one guy that's going to become that, oh, I guess, ultra primary ball handler. I just think there's going to be times over the next few weeks that we see that game plan change. Who do you think that's going to be? Ultimately, I like, think like when w- once Duke gets to the NCAA tournament, who's who's uh, initiating the offense primarily? I think we're in a great position if uh, if if I say this, I think is going to be Tyrese Proctor. Um, oh. I, I think I think as as he keeps maturing and keeps growing, if he's the primary ball handler day one in the NCAA tournament, I think a lot great has happened. It's not necessarily anything that bad that's happened to Jeremy Roach or Jalen Blakes. I think that Tyrese Proctor being the primary ball handler is the best version of Duke. Just like you mentioned, the best version of Duke probably has Dariq Whitehead in the starting lineup instead of coming off the bench. All right, Donald, let's pick our play of the game, our highlight of the game, and we'll do a player of the week real quick before we go to the break and then preview the NC State game. So give me your play of the game. I think you mentioned it earlier, but but walk me through it one more time. Yeah, it's it's. So my play of the game was uh, Ryan Young's first offensive rebound catches the ball. There's three Florida State guys around him, and he somehow does a dream shake to dream shake all three of them out of the way, and then I lays it in. I love that play. It was and such I, a great play. I watched this game on a little bit of delay, so I like I knew ahead of time that Ryan Young is going to have this awesome game, and he comes in and has that bucket, and I was like, ah, I get it. I, I think the second play that I had. Uh, was uh, Jalen Blake's. I believe it was the second three of the ball game, but he hits the three and he came down. And he kind of did the drum string uh, with his with his hand, and it led the guys on the broadcast. I think it was um, uh, Corey Alexander. Corey and, Alexander. Uh, yeah, he was like, "Is he trying to do the guitar? Because his his left hand isn't up. It's just the it's just the hand drum of the strings." But it was clear that like Jalen Blake's, as soon as he shot that, he turned around and started doing it, and was like, "Yo." Give me the ball. I'm confident. I, I'm making these shots tonight. So I he, thought that was a really cool play too. He almost felt uncomfortable with how excited and confident he was. Yeah, he's like, "Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm that dude." Oh, we're doing this. Okay. Are we doing this oh, tonight? Oh, cool. cool. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll do it. Uh, I like that. I had, uh, I had a play where uh, Jacob Grandison made an entry pass to Ryan Young, who made a quick post move. And meanwhile, Grandison got himself open again and Young immediately passed it back to him for Grandison to get a three. As good as Ryan Young was looking when it was like grabbing offensive rebounds and, and going downhill to the basket, like we were talking about in, in the good, the fact that he was also able to hunt assists like that and, and continue to like have the court vision to, to be able to find guys on the perimeter is an awesome development. And it's just, you know, further proof that Ryan Young is is in in a pretty big way, it seems like, holding this team together with a with a team full of, let's be real at this point, not great outside shooting. Uh Ryan Young is is trying as as best he can to uh to make it better. All right. And let's do our players of the week. Uh if you would like to go first, Donald, uh, you may pick Ryan Young. So why don't you just go ahead and do that? You don't pitch a perfect game and not get player of the week. It's Ryan Young. I almost wanted to give it to Jalen Blakes because he was so spectacular in this game, but we gave him a we gave Jalen Blakes all the kudos for the weight game. So to your point, Ryan Young was like the story everywhere last night and and a statistical like like a very rare statistical performance for Young. So I th- I think he'll get the sweep today. I imagine that Jason would have given him the same if he was here. Let's take a quick break, Donald. We'll be back to talk about Duke's upcoming game against NC State. We also need to make note of, on the women's side, Duke's huge win against NC State this week, a very good NC State team. So stick around. Welcome back. Duke is at NC State on Wednesday night, 7 p.m. at PNC Arena. It is. It should be an interesting game. NC State coming into this one, Donald, I'll, I'll tee this up a little bit for you, and then I, I want you to tell us a little bit more in depth about NC State's season so far. Kevin Keats' squad is 11-4 and four overall. They are just 1-3 in ACC play. But the, the question that I pose to you maybe as you run through NC State's schedule is, do you think that NC State is kind of a little better than their record indicates or kind of a little worse than their record indicates? And I feel like you could take this answer in either direction. 
honestly, I'm going to go in the middle. The jury's still out. I, I think this is a big bellwether game for this team. And, and when you think about NC State over the past few years, they've had a couple of years where just like you kind of see, you they have it in what many would call an inflated record during the non-conference portion of the schedule. And then they get to the ACC season. They kind of struggle to start the season, but then they have a big win against a, you know either Duke or UNC or or Virginia or something like that, and they propel themselves back into the bubble race. And they you know either make it or they just barely miss the bubble. This is setting up to be a similar type of season, as you mentioned. They're eleven and four. Their big wins are against Dayton, Butler, and Vanderbilt. I mean, you know, Power Five team to you know Dayton and Butler, decent teams, but not like. We're not talking top, you know, 10 teams or anything like it's that. It's possible, but, Donald, that none of those are NCAA tournament teams. It's possible. But again, they have the name recognition where you can kind of go, oh, yeah, you beat Dayton. OK, cool. Uh, their losses, they have four losses. Again, you mentioned they're one and three in the ACC. Their only non-conference loss was to Kansas. Uh, but then since they started in or ACC play, they've lost to Pitt, Miami and Clemson. And I think if you're looking at uh, very quickly, if you're looking at NC State, when you're looking at this game, I'm looking at rebounding because they're a decent rebounding team, especially on the defensive end. And, you know, that kind of battle between our offensive rebounding and their defensive rebound, that'll be an interesting one. I think whoever wins the rebounding battle will have a huge edge, but also NC State's ability to get to the line. They're not great at getting to the line. They do make their free throws when they get there, but they're not great at at drawing contact and getting to the line. And Duke is not a, a team that forces a lot of players to the free throw line to take free throws. So I'm, I'm going to see, I'm going to see say, how they do. Uh, that. I would say weird uh, second half officiating against Florida state aside. No. Yes. Yes. Um, but I, I do think that's going to be interesting to see how they game plan. Are they going to go right at us and try to draw fouls, get guys in foul trouble? Because, you know, we do get guys in, we do have guys that get into foul trouble on occasion, but is it a thing where they're going to try and draw fouls and get to the line and beat us by shooting free throws they're going to have to take a lot of free throws. And I think, again, when we look at the stats, whoever attempted the most free throws, I think will be the team standing tall at the end. I don't think NC State wants to get into a depth battle with Duke. This is a, not a team that has a ton of depth. Stepping back real quick and looking at their schedule, uh, the thing that stands out to me is that, as I said, Dayton is probably the best team they've beaten Dayton is not a surefire NCAA tournament team. It's possible to this point in the season, NC State has lost uh, their games against every team that is going to make the NCAA tournament. Uh, they are they are similarly sort of they they had a game against Clemson on Friday that was uh, somewhat lopsided loss, fourteen points. Although the game was at Little John, that game sort of returned them to ACC play following the Christmas break. And then they've got Duke this week, next this or th- this coming weekend they've got Virginia Tech. Next week they have Miami. And then a game against Georgia Tech before they play, before they lose, of course, at North Carolina, because they always do. So a really tough stretch where NC State is playing three or four of the five best ACC teams in a five game stretch coming up. So I know they're looking at the schedule and saying, of course, they want to beat Duke. That's the that's the first game that's in front of them. But it's a it's going to be a, a tough go here. And this is the part of the season that is going to make or break it for NC State. If they're going to make it to the NCAA tournament, they can't lose all of these upcoming games. And these are the the best shots they have until they get Virginia in, in a few weeks in February. But I do think the one thing that they can probably, you know, have some confidence with is that we as Duke traditionally do not play well when we go to NC State. And we've had some bad losses at NC State over the years. It is one NC of my State. least favorite ACC arenas. Yeah, it's one Duke of those here. things where no matter what, they their their crowd is into it. So for Duke's perspective, the energy and the intensity have to be there. Just like we saw at Wake, if if we if we don't come with the intensity, we could get run out of the gym. And and that hopefully they're watching that or at least reminding uh, John Shire and the staff is reminding this team of how they played against Wake Forest and say, hey, you cannot do that against NC State because NC State will get you, especially on their court. That's traditionally where they have gotten the most wins against us. So looking at their at their lineup a little bit, I told you that NC State is not very deep. Uh, they're running six or seven guys at this point. They They only really played seven guys in their most recent game against Clemson and against Vanderbilt. They 
kind of ran a six man rotation. They did lose a big man uh, a few weeks ago to knee surgery, Dusan Mohorcic, who was a transfer who came in from Utah, uh, a guy who was also suspended from Utah last season. I, I, I'm not sure exactly what the story is with Mohorcic, but he's um, he's out at least for now, having had knee surgery, and he was going to be a key player for state this season. So depth is is definitely a problem. And you mentioned, Donald, they might try to get Duke into foul trouble. I envision that Duke is going to is going to be trying to get NC State into a ton of foul trouble. Their main big man is a guy named DJ Burns. He's a big fella who who transferred uh, from Winthrop this season. So he's experienced. He's a pretty strong rebounder. But uh, on a per 40 basis, he averages five fouls. Duke has more big men to throw at DJ Burns than DJ Burns has himself to throw at Duke. So uh, do not be surprised if if one of the Duke bigs decides to get into a, you know, in, into an attempted block and and, you know, kind of rough and tumble battle with DJ Burns, because once he's out, frankly, NC State doesn't have a ton of size to throw at Duke. Their other starters, the guys who are going to play the bulk of the minutes, 6'1", Jarkel Joyner, 6'3", Casey Morsel, 6'4", Terquavion Smith, who Duke fans will remember, and 6'8", Jack Clark. So uh, not a big tame team for NC State. The other thing you were talking about earlier, Donald, that's interesting here is that Derek Lively didn't play much against Florida State. There was a little bit of that game where Duke went with a slightly smaller rotation where they only had one big man on the floor. Don't be surprised to see more of that in this game. Uh, Mark Mitchell may be able to guard everybody on NC State without needing a ton of help from the bigs. So this could be a game where Duke is able to get more production from the wing players than they've been able to rely on against bigger teams. And I think it's going to be interesting that DJ Burns battle if he goes up against Ryan Young when he's in the game, uh, because you mentioned how good he can be. Uh, but also when you look at Ryan Young, if according to Ken Palm, he is the number seven uh, in, in offensive rating in the country, the entire country. So Ryan Young has been whenever he's in the game, he's been effective. He's a number he's a number 12 offensive rebounding rate and he has the number nine two point field goal percentage. So uh, that's going to be a key battle. If Derek Lively, obviously, like you said, if he's going to be splitting time with Ryan Young, Derek Lively is got to do something on the offensive end to keep DJ Burns. And also, I mean, defensively, I think, you know, he can hang with DJ Burns, but offensively that position is going to have to generate, you know, a lot of, you know, touches, points, scoring chances, whatever you want to call them. Brian Young has been good at doing that when he's in the game. Derek Wiley also has to step up. This is a big challenge for him. I imagine that when Kevin Keats is looking at preparing for this game, it's frustrating to him that, that, He's he's got this recent tape he's on Ryan Young. He's yeah. like, ah, <laughs> shoot, I guess we have to prepare for this now. This is this is annoying. Uh, on the wing, the uh, the major contributors for state we mentioned Smith, uh, Jarkel Joiner is a transfer from Ole Miss. He's also very experienced. He's a super senior and or super senior at least in in academic terms. This is his fifth year in college basketball. So uh, plenty of experience for state in the backcourt that Duke is going to need to be able to handle. Uh, I'm curious if Jeremy Roach is going to be healthy enough to play big minutes against state. That's the one area I think where, um, where they may be able to cause a lot of challenges for Duke is, is generating offense from the outside and also being pesky on defense on offense. NC state does not turn the ball over very much. Uh, the only guys really that, that are prone to that are uh, Terquavion Smith and DJ Burns. The rest of them are pretty good at hanging on to the ball. So I'm not sure that Duke is going to be able to generate turnovers the way they have against some weaker offensive opponents. Not to say that NC State is like the best offense in the world, but they're 43rd in Ken Palm. Um, they're not a bad offense. So it's uh, that'll be an, an interesting battle for um, for Duke is, is trying to trying to turn NC State over where uh, it's clearly a strength of theirs. The other interesting thing here, uh, NC State plays fairly fast. This is the rare Duke team I know we've mentioned before that uh, plays at a fairly slow tempo for a variety of reasons, I think, some of them being the injuries and the inconsistency in the rotation, but some of it being just a, you know, preferred for the the main contributors on this team. So we'll continue watching to see if, if Duke is able to maintain their tempo as opposed to having to play around at NC state's tempo. If state is able to, to make Duke a little bit more frantic, especially in their home arena, that could also spell trouble. Uh, I do not want to see Duke lose a, a, another ACC game here early in the season with, with tougher opponents admittedly uh, coming up soon. 
Yeah, I, I think that's the key here is this is a team that we should beat, whether we're at home or on the road. Yes, it's usually a difficult challenge to go to Raleigh and beat them, but this is a game that we have to win. It's not necessarily a must-win game in that scenario, but it is a game that you want to come out and show the effort that and kind of establish to the rest of the ACC like, yo, we're back from break and, and we're back with an attitude. This is the game that kind of, you know, take tell NC State that whatever – hope they had of, of mounting a little challenge against us is going to go by the wayside very quickly. Ken Pomeroy says that this game is basically a toss up. He's got Duke winning by two points in Raleigh. So uh, take with that what you will, but we'll be watching for that on Wednesday. We will also uh, return after that to recap that game and then preview Duke's second game against Boston college. For some reason, uh, Duke is going to have four ACC games under their belt and have to return play to Boston College pretty soon, but we'll be back at the end of the week to do that. Donald, very quickly, give me the the rundown from Duke women's basketball's huge victory against NC State a few days ago. Yeah, so they went to Reynolds Coliseum, and you know, first of all, NC State, one of the premier women's basketball programs in the entire country. Uh, they are they are great. They're number six in the country right now, and Duke not only went over there and beat them. But they beat them pretty handily. It was 72 to 58, the final score. They were up 35 to 23 at the half. And no matter what, they just got hot from three and just kept put it, pouring it on. Anytime that NC State kind of mounted a serious challenge to get back into the game, Duke would shoot them right back into a 10, 12 point lead. The, and then they followed up with just today, they beat Louisville, uh, uh, you know, again. So they're 13 and one on the year, they're three and oh in the ACC. They are now a team that people have to look at as a contender for the ACC championship. And I know there's a lot of great ACC programs out there that are really good. Notre Dame is one of them. Um, NC State is still going to be there. North Carolina is still going to be there at the end. But Duke and, and Kara Lassa and, their, and her staff have done a great job. And these players have done a tremendous job so far this year. Their lone losses against UConn, which, hey, everyone loses to UConn. That's that we can, you can, you know, be okay with that. And the, the fact is even against UConn, they were competitive in that loss. So uh, congrats to them on the big win over NC state. And hopefully they can keep it going throughout the rest of the ACC part of the season. Absolutely. All right. We will leave it there on that note. Let's hope that uh, Duke is able to continue the wins against NC state in all sports, in all basketball uh, for the rest of this week. So, uh, continue to email us dbrpodcast at gmail.com uh, we love getting the emails and the updates especially now it seems like a lot more folks are emailing us from the games which is great to get uh, sort of reactions from what's going on in Cameron uh, we, we love that kind of stuff especially since we are not able to be there as much as we have been in years past so for Jason Evans who is on his way home for Donald Wine who is at home I am Sam Klein this has been episode 473 of the Duke Basketball Report podcast, Duke Band, take us home. So let me tell you real quick, uh, my I know the cop story yeah, 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 from the village people. So this was maybe at this point, it was damn near 20 years ago. Um, I'm pretty sure I was in, I had just started college uh, when we went on uh, my family and I took a cruise and we're sailing on this cruise. And, you know, they obviously the, the big ships have like basketball courts and gyms and stuff like that. So me and my brother hit the basketball court and this old guy, uh, I, I say old, but he was like, you know, at that time he was like, my dad's age, so he's clearly older than us. Um, he's out in the court, he's shooting some J's, and you know, we're just kind of, you know, shooting around, like no yeah. real game going on. And I'm like, hey, I'm gonna go get some lunch. I'm kind of hungry. Uh, they're like, hey, do you guys want to run, uh, run, run some court? And my brother's like, yeah, I'll stay. And I was like, I'm just gonna go get some food, or whatever. So, flash forward to like maybe an hour later, my brother finds us, and he's like, yo, that dude tore his Achilles. And we're like, oh man, like the, the old guy, like yeah, he tore his kill. He's like, oh, that sucks. Like, like that's so bad. And they're like, yeah, he, he looked bad, but you know, he just like turned and his his like he said his uh, Achilles popped, and that was that. So we saw his. We we had met his family at Bingo. Um, 
earlier in the in the week. Yes, we're a bingo family. We do that. Um, so later on at the buffet, we're at the late night buffet and we run into uh his wife and his daughter. And we kind of go, Hey, how's your like how's your husband? She's like, Oh, well, he tore his Achilles. And me, my brother, and my cousin are standing there like, oh, that really sucks. Like, we're really sorry. And he's they're like, Yeah, his bandmates are gonna be upset. And we're like, Ben? Oh, is he in the band? And so, like, they kind of look at each other like, oh, no, we, we, we've we said too much. And she's like, yeah, yeah, they do like a band and they perform at some places in New York City, like nothing, nothing big. And my cousin at the time lives in uh, Westchester. So she's like, yo, I go to New York quite often to hang out. Like, where do they where do they perform? And she mentions the, some random club and she's like, oh, yeah, I actually go there quite a bit. Are they like, you know, like the house band? She's in the uh, wife is like, no, no, they just perform there from time to time. And she's like, oh, well, that'd be, you know, next time they're in town, like, I'd love to come in and, and check them out. What's the name of their group? And she goes, the village people. <laughs> and we just are like, I'm sorry, you said the, like, the, like, the, like, the village, the village people? people? <laughs> like, no, no, did you, like, are it's like a cover band of the village people? She's like, no, it's the village people. And we're like, hold up, your husband is one of the village people. And she's like, yes. <laughs> so my cousin's like, just out of curiosity, which one is he? And she's like, he's the cop. And we're like, uh, he's Glenn Hughes. No, he's the no, new, wait. I quote the new cop, Ray Simpson. Oh, okay. <laughs> which I'm Ray Simpson, that. Ray Simpson is a part of a just legendary family of musicians like i mean all of them hit big his i believe his cousin his cousin ashford and simpson that is simpson his brother so we're sitting here we're like wait a minute you are the cop from the village people and she's like yeah we don't like to make a big deal about it i'm like yeah i understand that's that's not a group that's very it's not a local group everybody know who they are like yeah. everybody so yeah, that's how I met them. I'm really, you know, I still keep in touch with uh, his daughter because um, we, you know, we were about the, we we're about the same age, so we, you know, obviously kept in touch after um, the cruise. But yeah, that's how I know the cop from the village people. That's incredible.